Hello, everyone. My name is Andres Hacke, and I'm the founder of the Office for Political Innovation. It's always been surprising for many people that an office, an architectural office, is called Office for Political Innovation. But for me, architecture is very much about how we negotiate coexistence. And that's particularly the way that I understand politics. Politics is how heterogeneity can compose something that, that, that all of us are part of. The, the, this is a, an image from Molina de Segura in the 1940s. Molina de Segura is a landscape in the south of Europe that was basically shaped by the way very fast rainfall could carve the topography and create these veins that in Spanish are called ramblas, ravines. The ramblas ecosystems are very dry, but in these veins are water accumulates and biodiversity is nurtured. This is the same landscape uh, now. And as you've seen, urbanization has basically meant the destruction of a big part of these ramblas. And with that, also the disappearance of a big part of the biodiversity and the climate uh, role that they play in for a larger ecosystem. When I see this, many questions come uh, for architecture, for architectural practices. What is the way that we can intervene now here? What is the way that even in a moment when growth is uh, it's been limited, still the ravines are disappearing and they're climatic role that is more needed than ever, it's not being played. This is what these ramblas look like at the time that they're full of water, and this is what they look like in the times that they're dry. Still, as you see, the role of keeping humidity is crucial in the overall uh, uh, biodiversity of the area. This is the rambla climate house, a rambla that we designed in one of these lots one of these that was still uh, 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 making it possible to operate on an existing ravine that was uh, dying. This ravine that was previously occupied by another construction that fall apart and fall down basically was the purpose of the house. This is not a house that caters to humans. This is a house that caters to the more than human extensions of, of, of what our societies are. The house basically takes advantage of the fact that humans consume water that then becomes great water. The 300 liters of great water that is used in this house every day is accumulated in a very simple way in tanks that allow then, through the mediation of sensors that uh, permanently are testing and sensing the, uh, the degree of humidity in the ravine, uh, to spray the water as an artificial non-human controlled uh, uh, climate or meteorology that then helps repairing in the long run the biodiversity of the ravine. This is the way it operates, and as you see, this is where the accent of the house is uh, uh, placed. But of course, this is the way human life also can basically be rearticulated with the ecosystem so that the overall uh, agreement or an alliance between humans and their more than human dimension, it's something that could be constructed on basis of justice and reparation. The house is basically a house that understands that whatever we do, whatever technology, is now catering not only to humans, but to more than human communities. And that is basically making possible the reparation of the damage, the progressive, slow, associative, collaborative reparation of the damage that through modernity and through uh, urbanization was infringed, uh, infringed uh, uh, on these ravines. This is a project that we've developed in association with a number of ecology activists in, in the region, with uh, 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 ethologists, with etymologists, with people that basically have been working for a long, run, for a long, long time uh, on the climate of this area, and that basically became a demonstrative element that is now used to advocate for the transformation of the entire, of the way the whole, uh, all these suburban houses operate climatically and trans taking the water and basically using them to repair the, the uh, collaboratively uh, the ravines. But what is important for me is also that this is the place where people like Fatima live now and the effect of this is basically that the new relationship of the new opportunities for a relationship with nature are being nurtured through the architecture, through the mobilization of particular reparative architecture. And this is the beginning of another project that is tapping of our overall uh, engagement with transspecies justice, which is the Regio School. 
A radio school is a school that is in Madrid, in Spain, that was opened uh, um, almost a, a year ago, and that is basically also thinking what is the way that from uh, uh, from the from from the southern of the of the north, it's possible to think ecologically and not only challenging the hyper technological uh, approach to sustainability and hyper corporate uh, uh, approach to the use to mobilization of means, but rather thinking of alternatives to that. By nakedness, 40% of the overall material mobilization of the building was uh, eliminated just by letting all the systems be visible, by not decorating them, by basically using as simple materials as possible and removing everything that was superfluous. The other thing is that 20% of all the materials were basically reclaimed, or materials that have been sitting for decades in warehouses because they were no longer fashionable or, or, or appealing to designers. For instance, these, brick, uh, these glass bricks, that you see here were basically, uh, had been abandoned more than three decades ago in a warehouse and we found the people that were now in their 80s and that could come here to place them and to install them in the building. But also this is an opportunity to think ecologically about pedagogy, to show that basically architecture allows people to engage and to understand how we are part of larger systems of water, energy, waste, by looking at the way our systems are connecting our bodies with landscapes. This is also a form to understand pedagogy as something that basically allows people to be part of the making of their environment. The whole design was developed with the kids that were going to be using the building and we, did, we enrolled them in helping us uh, through the design so that they could also have a say on how was it designed. When we look at uh, schools like this, or like this, which is basically what 90% of the schools look like, basically we see how architecture is mobilized as a technology of exclusivity. And this technology of exclusivity is done through two very particular architectural uh, strategies. The first one is expansiveness, occupation of land, and the second is privative control on the land. This horizontal spread of schools is very much catering to the possibility of controlling who is part of those communities that are built by the schools. We did the other, we basically tried to confront that and be dissident to this tradition of schools by concentrating the school in one point, by doing a school that would be vertical and therefore it obliged to have articulation of the different uses in an ecological way, but also minimizing its foot, uh, footprint Basically, this is a school that has one-fifth of the footprint of what it would have had spread out like normally schools do. But also, this is a school without a playground. This is the playground of the school. The school is a, a dissident to the idea of privatized control on the land. Basically, it's the public, the common, the shared space of the parks, of the city, of this uh, area of, of um, uh, shared area of land what becomes the playground of the school, and a playground that is shared by others, humans and more than humans, and where kids are obliged somehow to, and instigated to learn how to coexist with others in sharing infrastructures. This is the first day of school. People run into the public space, to these parks and these uh, parts of the city, and this is how they basically, uh, or how I imagine uh, the, the school, as something that basically brings all this energy to the entire ecosystem, and basically where teachers are there not that much to control, but just to witness what is happening. <laughs> this is the way the section speaks about this. This is a little bit of an ecosystem in itself, where the, basically with the different ages, the different uses, the very different parts of the school are overlapping and stacking on each other. This is the way basically the stacking happens very literally. And this is allows, for instance, to have a school that is built on heterogeneity. Nothing is unified. Every part of the school is different, different architecturally. This is the place where the grown-ups are. This is the gym that doubles as an assembly. This is the way the gym expands into this loggia that is like a balcony on the landscape. This is this loggia. This is the gym. This is the staircases. This is the, in the bottom or the down there, the place where the youngest kids are that opens directly to the land and allows them to, to basically expand what happens in the classroom to what happens outdoors. But I think this verticality is also a way to think of a very intense way 
to relate to nature as something that is not controlled, but rather accidentally emerging everywhere. And this is something, of course, that we've been looking at for a long time through our architecture in places like this, where basically people, this is our house in Never Neverland, where people are learning how to coexist with trees. That, and in this case, this is much more intense. All the water from the rainfall is collected in the roofs and then escalate down to a series of gardens that are learning from previous experiences. This is the, our project for Cosmo PS1. And basically, the entire building is full of these gardens. These gardens are crucial because are gardens that are making it possible that the building contributes to the overall uh, biodiversity of the area. So it's not only that the kids don't have a playground and go there to the other, to what is surrounding the building, the public space that is surrounding the building. It's also that the building is making possible, for instance, to have a specific gardens that instigate the presence of bees and support bees or bat or butterflies, pollinizers that would then contribute to the overall biodiversity of the area. And this is something that we keep discussing with the kids. Uh, this is, for instance, one of the kids that did this photograph that called my school looks like a robot made of, man, uh, of butter. And for me, this is very beautiful because it's precisely this wrapping, what it's also explaining what the, what the school is. This is a cork projected uh, cladding that we invented that with the time will look like this. It's a support for life that is porous and allows for the humidity to translate into a hood habitat that will allow liquid and moss to, to basically uh, co progressively covering the cork of the building. And if you see this, build, this photograph, I like the contrast between our building, this cork-wrapped um, ecosystem, or cork-inviting uh, ecosystem, in contrast with these aluminum towers at the back. And I think there's a lot to say about the shininess of architecture that is not inviting and preventing anything to, to grow in it. I believe in a living architecture that actually is creating this poroness. And I think who would want uh, shininess when you can have this? Thank you very much.